towards the end of the study. Okay. All right, got it. Okay. All right. So I have no financial disclosures. So I think most of what I talk about is going to be on label for FDA um, purposes. Um, the overview is we're going to talk about status epilepticus. That's the main sort of seizure emergency that you'll hear about. That is a major medical emergency for people with epilepsy. I'll review some of what we know about rescue medications that family and nurses have used um, to try to hold off status epilepticus, at least trying to abort recurrent seizures as quick as possible. Um, Hopefully I can get to sort of some of the psychiatric comorbidities that people with epilepsy also experience and a rare condition that's called post ictal psychosis that can also be considered an emergency depending on the situation. Um, we do give anti-epileptic medications and we often throw around terms when we try to review side effects such as dizziness, lightheadedness, um, but something that we always talk about, but you may not be aware of are like skin reaction, drug rashes, and a condition called Steven Johnson syndrome. And a little bit of information about drug toxicity, because sometimes that does become an emergency when there's an adverse reaction to either a medication or how much medication, or if you start another medication that could potentially interact with your seizure medications. So status epileptic is, is a medical emergency. Um, the theoretical sort of idea of what status epileptic is, is, is that it's a failure of the brain means of terminating a seizure, or the brain for some reason acquires the ability to generate excessive neuronal activity that prolongs the seizures from occurring. So when a person experiences a seizure, typically that seizure would last anywhere between 10 seconds to maybe five minutes. Most often the seizure would end by about three minutes. And that could be, you know, epilepsy has a variety of seizure types. So it's not always uh, something that I can say, this is what status epilepticus is. Um, it just depends on the person's seizure type. All right, but if we talk about, uh, let's start with a complex partial seizure that generalizes. So a person may start with a degree of cognitive impairment, confusion that progresses for about a minute, that then over a course of a minute then becomes a generalized seizure. And that generalized seizure involves whole body convulsion, body stiffening, you know, everything is shaking. That usually goes on for about two minutes. And then it stops and the person may require anywhere between five and 30 minutes to recover um, as their brain recovers. All right. But when do we call it status epilepticus? Well, it often depends on what type of seizure that person is experiencing. Is it a convulsive seizure? If it's a convulsive seizure in status, we call it convulsive status epilepticus that usually carries the greatest risk of morbidity and mortality because of uh, the, the amount of demand that a convulsion in status epilepticus is demanding. It's, it can affect cardiac function, uh, blood flow, hypertension, and then it can result in end organ damage, uh, kidney failure, liver failure, if the seizure goes on for a much greater period of time. Absence status epilepticus, it's still a seizure, but it carries the least risk of mortality. Now, absence status is usually um, in someone who's just like just in a twilight state. They're, they're able to talk, they're able to carry a conversation, but they're just acting a little off. Their memory is maybe a little bit impaired, but they're, they're, they're mobile. All right, and that carries the least risk of mortality because it's not generating a lot of demand on the body. Another term that's thrown around is this condition called non-convulsive status epilepticus. And that's usually when a person has a new brain injury, not necessarily that they have epilepsy, but they have some new 
acute brain pathology, either from a stroke, a traumatic brain injury, um, uh, a sudden bleeding in the brain, tumor. So, but they're not convulsing, they're not shaking, but they're they're acting out of it. Uh, and they could either be in a coma or they're just unable to communicate. This carries mortality based on the underlying pathology. In any of these conditions, time is brain. You know, we have to be able to recognize this as soon as possible and call on emergency medicine, medical services like 911 so that these, the, the seizure, a prolonged seizure can be treated in a timely manner to stop the recurrence of the seizures. So this is a little technical, um, just try to bear with me a bit um, because when it comes to status epilepticus, the definition matters. Um, the medical terminology of what status epilepticus is often changes over the decades. So what we called status epilepticus in the 1980s, is it a little different than the 2000s? And it has recently changed with an updated definition. All right. But what we have to consider is that status epilepticus is a condition characterized by an epileptic seizure that is sufficiently prolonged or repeated to cause uh, a, just an enduring epileptic condition. So the seizure itself is causing the seizure to continue. Like in the beginning, I said, most seizures will end, but there is a portion of a non insignificant portion of individuals who has a seizure and that seizure just self propagates and doesn't stop until there is a direct intervention. So early on, the definition of status epilepticus was continuous seizure activity or recurrent multiple seizures without return to cognitive baseline after 30 minutes. It's presumed that if the seizure continues beyond 60 minutes, there's irreversible neuronal injury. Now, 30 minutes is a long time for anybody to wait. Like if you're a parent or significant other or a caretaker, if someone's having a seizure for longer than 30 for 30 minutes, nobody wants to wait that long. I mean, waiting one minute itself is an eternity for some people. So, so that's not a workable definition. Um, so there has been some sort of nuanced adjustments to the definition of status epilepticus. We now base it off of two time points because we need to recognize when should we intervene with a medication or calling emergency medical services? And when is it too long where if we let it keep going that there's gonna be irreversible brain injury? So there's two time points. Time one is continuous convulsive seizure activity for five minutes. So if someone's having a convulsion for five minutes or they have re repetitive convulsions and just doesn't return to sort of stopping seizure or waking up within five minutes, that we will call status epilepticus. So five, that's why we ask people to take a, you know, take a watch, time it, time how long the convulsive seizure is, because if it goes beyond five minutes, then we should consider that status epilepticus. Time point two is if we let that seizure go beyond 30 minutes, there's a risk of long-term consequences. Um, we, we suspect it at 30 minutes based on a lot of animal studies, okay? So not a lot of human data, but we do know that if the status epilepticus goes untreated beyond an hour or two hours, then the ability to stop the seizure really is severely impacted. Okay, meaning that we, it's going to be more difficult to control the status epilepticus if we let it get beyond one hour and two hours. That's for convulsive seizure. We know that for five minutes, we should be calling it status epilepticus after five minutes. The gray zone comes in the absence status, the complex partial seizure status, the twilight state, the non-convulsive status where people are just acting off. We really don't have a good time definition of when should we call it status epilepticus. For now, if it's a person that's not having a convulsion, 
but they're confused and disoriented, or we, we recognize they're having a, a complex partial seizure for more than 10 minutes, then we're gonna call that non-convulsive status epilepticus. With these focal complex partial seizures, we really don't know how long is too long. We're just gonna estimate it about 60 minutes. That's time point two, all right? And, and, and we, we pick these time points out of concern that if we let it go too long, there's gonna be irreversible brain injury to where the seizure is starting from. They have demonstrated seizures in a variety of brain areas, such as the neocortex, the thalamus, and the hippocampus. A lot of what we describe as having what is a seizure is a network, is how those brain cells are all organized to perpetuate the seizure um, to be generated and persist. So there can result in atrophy, further neuronal injury, and loss of brain cells. Overall, the incidence of status epilepticus is anywhere between 10 to 40 people out of 100,000 people per year. All right. Again, the underlying etiology is the main driver as how severe an outcome comes. So if someone who has known epilepsy, they actually have a better prognosis in the setting of status epilepticus than someone who has an acute brain injury. So the studies revolving around status epilepticus really doesn't separate out people with epilepsy and people who had acute brain injury. And when I say acute brain injury, I'm, I'm talking about an acute stroke, bleeding in the brain, traumatic brain injury, meningitis, you know, something that happened to the brain at the moment of the status epilepticus. The, one of the primary reasons why a person with epilepsy will go into status epilepticus is either they're not taking the medications or the medication dose is insufficient where there's too low of anti-seizure medications or there's a degree of medication non-adherence. Um, I'm just giving you some numbers as to how severe status epilepticus is and that convulsive status epilepticus Mortality could be up to anywhere between 10 to 20, um, maybe up to 30% of patients if it's not adequately treated. With non-convulsive status epilepticus, um, again, it all depends on the underlying cause. It could be higher if there is a, an acute brain injury and not from the epilepsy itself. This is just to give you an overview as to the management of status epilepticus, what would happen if you call 911 and get EMS activated. Um, it's to give you a sense of what are the steps where we are trying to treat status epilepticus. All right. So the first stage is recognizing that this is a much longer seizure than usual. All right. So that's stage one, early status epilepticus, impending status epilepticus. That's where you recognize the person is having a seizure for more than five minutes. They are often given a rescue medication. And the rescue medication is typically a benzodiazepine. A benzodiazepine is a class of medications um, that includes clonazepam, lorazepam, uh, diazepam, and uh, midazolam. So anything with an, you know, IPAM type of ending is a medication that is used to terminate a prolonged seizure. All right. We give them about 15 to five to 10 minutes to determine if that medicine is sufficient. Sometimes, you know, the patient would be seen by the paramedics or EMTs. And if the person, by the time the EMTs arrive and they're still seizing, they may give a second dose of another benzodiazepine maybe a higher dose than what you would have started off with um, as a rescue medication. And then if they're still seizing after another 30 minutes go by, that's where we, we call it establish status epilepticus, that's stage two. So stage two is when you fail the rescue medication, the benzodiazepine um, doesn't stop the seizure. There at this point will be in the emergency department and they may receive another IV medication. 
The typical IV medication that is available includes phenytoin, um, uh, valproic acid, which is Depakote, or they may get levetiracetam or Keppra, or even Lucosamide, um, which is Vimpat. Those are available as an IV medicine. So, so in the emergency department, they would get that second line medication. At this point, the emergency department is going to want to admit the patient to the hospital for further monitoring. They may get um, an EEG started because we need to know based on what we see if these are uh, epileptic seizures and the EEG would help them because now they're sort of out of it and not responsive because of the amount of medications that they're getting. If the convulsion continues beyond 30 minutes after that second type of medication, unfortunately, we need to really be proactive and put them into a medical induced coma. So that's stage three, refractory status epilepticus. It's usually about 30 to 60 minutes from the onset of the seizure. The medical induced coma means that they're gonna have to be put under a mechanical ventilation, breathing tube, and put under IV anesthesia, which is typically propofol or continuous infusion of midazolam, uh, Versed is the, the trade name for it. And they would be put into a medical induced coma for about you know, 24 hours, along with EEG monitoring to see if the seizure is still going on or were we successful in stopping it. And so they would be in a medical induced coma for about 24 hours and they would take off the uh, IV anesthesia um, to see if the seizure is still happening. Hopefully the majority of patients at this point, you know, I, I should say 50% doesn't get to the point of IV anesthesia, but there are a certain percentage of people that will need the IV anesthesia. And after 24 hours, they come out of the medical induced coma and see if they have recovered. All right, so this is sort of an overview of what happens to a person in the hospital if they were to have persistent intractable status epilepticus. Now this is out of your hands when it happens. So what you can have help with is recognizing if there are increased seizures, we call it acute repetitive seizures or seizure clusters. These, this is a condition preceding status epilepticus, and sometimes it's hard to recognize, um, but it's concerning signs of increased seizure activity out of the norm. Now, epilepsy is a spectrum disorder. There are a variety of seizure types, and everyone has different seizure frequency, so I can't give one definition that fits everybody. It depends on what is the individual's baseline seizure frequency. Some people rarely have seizures. Some people have daily seizures. And we can't be treating someone with daily seizures as status epilepticus because that then that we're gonna be overly aggressive and putting them into a medical induced coma um, unnecessarily. You know, We don't like having daily seizures. That's where having a plan with your epilepsy doctor, neurologist, to come up with a regimen to reduce the seizure frequency as, as much as possible. A third of patients who have intractable recurrent seizures will continue to ha may have seizure clusters. Okay, so there's a, again, a large percentage of people who can experience a seizure cluster. And there's no clear definition of what a seizure cluster is. It's just based on what is your frequency of seizures in normal days versus seizure days. We sometimes use three, three or more seizures within a 12 hour or 24 hour period as a baseline. But if, if you're someone or someone you know has a, a higher seizure frequency, we just wanna see that, you, that it is an increase number of seizures within a specific time. And everyone's a little different. So this is where the discussion comes in, all right? We wanna make sure that is the duration between seizures getting shorter? Are the seizures getting longer? So we want an action plan for that individual specific seizure frequency. Once you recognize that this person does have seizure clusters, there are typically 
three methods of trying to abort seizures. The earliest one is rectal diazepam diastat. All right. We've recently, in the last couple of years, now have uh, a nasal spray, nasal benzodiazepine. And there's actually two types, nasal midazolam, which is nasolam, and nasal diazepam, which is Valtoco. Um, in Europe, it's not available in the United States, but we do sometimes use it off-label with available sort of oral solutions of lorazepam or oral solutions of um, diazepam, which is a, a, a buccal administration, all right? The rectal diazepam was re approved in 1997. It is often weight-based weight dosing, and it's approved for um, two years of age and older. The nasal benzodiazepine, their approval came out in 2019 and 2021. Nasolam was first. Uh, it's only approved for 12 years and older. Um, it's a single dosing regimen, so it's not weight-based. And Valtoco, the nasal diazepam, is weight-based, but it's approved for six years and older. So between two and six years old, the only uh, approved rescue therapy is rectal diazepam. In Europe, they do have a pre-filled oral, like a syringe with midazolam, um, but it's oftentimes oft very difficult to administer and it requires refrigeration. So it's not something that you could carry in a purse every single day or next or keep at the bedside. Um, so it, it is a little more difficult because it has to be refrigerated. Um, and, and then you have to get it out and fill a syringe. So, so using an oral rescue medication is not the best in trying to acutely abort a seizure. Um, I, I don't know if you can see the images. Um, this is the set of instructions for uh, rectal gel diazepam. Um, I believe if you go to epilepsy.com, um, there is a video uh, that's on there on how to use um, a diazepam rectal gel. When I was reading up on this literature about rescue medication, I'm surprised that about um, only less than half of people, parents, um, caretakers have ever been educated upon, upon how to use this rectal gel. We just, physicians like me will just write the prescription expecting that you would know how to use it for some reason. So, um, so I'm trying to give out um, sort of the, the pictures here. Um, so the diazepam rectal gel comes in a, uh, a, a pre-filled syringe. It's gonna be dosed based on the patient's weight. All right, so you may get one syringe or two syringes. Um, the first thing to do is to make sure that you have the patient in a position that you could administer the rectal gel. So typically you, you want them on a bed or on the floor or on their side towards you, pull towards you, all right? And you wanna pull down their pants so that you have access to the rectum. Um, you have the syringe, you remove the cap, make sure you also take off the sealed pin. You put it in the lubricating jelly that comes with the packet to, okay. And then you insert the tip of the syringe into the patient's rectum. You count to three while gently pushing the plunger. And then you count to three um, before removing the syringe from the rectum. All right, so just to give it some time to, to get in there. And once you remove the syringe, you hold the buttocks together and count to three to prevent leakage. All right, if needed, you could administer another dose um, four to 12 hours later. So this is a bit complicated. It may work with a child between two and six years of age. Again, the older the individual, the more difficult it is to, um, to administer, you know, older individuals, you know, I deal with mostly adult patients and caretakers. There's a lot of sort of embarrassment of ha having to, to do a rectal gel. So fortunately we do now have a nasal benzodiazepine um, and it's a lot easier. It comes in a pre-filled uh, type of syringe. Um, you hold it. So I have here a picture of how to hold the the device, there's a nozzle and a plunger, and you put your 
thumb underneath the plunger. Just don't push it in until you have it in position and you hold um, your index finger and your middle finger in um, sort of on the side of these um, of the nozzle. You place the nozzle up into one of the nays, um, nares, all right, and you push. You aim towards in between the eyes. That's sort of like to get to the brain because at the top of your olfactory system, there's a very thin plate that has more direct access to the blood, um, uh, to the blood um, supply to the brain. So that's why a nasal spray may work a lot easier and a lot faster. Um, usually with nasal midazolam, it's typically one five milligram dose and you could repeat it 10 minutes if the seizure is continuing. With nasal diazepam, depending on the weight of the patient, you may have to use two nasal sprays to administer one dose. And you can't repeat nasal diazepam at least for another four hours. All right. So that's um, the rescue medications. Um, I just want, I know I, I, I'm trying to keep track of time, but I want to at least go through some of the psychiatric emergencies um, with, with people with epilepsy. About one in three people with epilepsy also has a comorbid psychiatric disorder, okay? Um, the overall prevalence of active depression is about 23 or a third of patients, or, or a quarter of patients with epilepsy. And about a fifth of patients, that's 20% of people with epilepsy, also has anxiety disorder. There are a five to 7% of people with epilepsy who also have psychosis or schizoaffective disorder. This is thoughts of delusions, hallucinations, and bizarre behavior. Psychiatric disorders are more common in individuals with drug-resistant epilepsy. And individuals with intractable epilepsy and psychiatric comorbidities have a significantly higher risk for sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. The psychiatric condition can be seen as what we call inner ictal phenomenon. So in, in throughout their course of their life in between seizures, but sometimes sort of mania or psychosis can develop during the post ictal period, all right? So um, that's, that's another significant period where not the seizure, not that they're having a seizure, but their thoughts and behaviors become severely disorganized. So a lot of our medications have a black box warning for risk of increased suicidal thoughts. And here I list some of the medications that have significant psychiatric side effects. Barbiturates are associated with depression. A lot of the medications we give can also increase irritability, hyperactivity, aggression, especially with levetiracetam, benzodiazepines, such as clonazepam. Um, uh, depression is often seen in topiramate and zinisamide. Um, and with lamotrigine, again, there is more of the hyperactivity and irritability. So these are just examples of psychiatric side effects related to anti-seizure medications. Post-ictal psychosis is often under-recognized. This is because there's a variety of symptoms that happen in the post-ictal period. In the past, this would be called post-ictal aggression, post-ictal fury, acute attacks of insanity, so those are you know, older terms that have been thrown around for this period of time where there is bizarre behavior. Often it's a psychotic episode that happens within seven days from the last generalized tonic-clonic seizure or cluster of seizures. All right, this is in the exclusion as it being caused by medication toxicity um, itself. All right, people who, have, who are at significant risk for this condition is having an underlying depression, anxiety disorder, often bilateral temporal lobe epilepsy, a longer duration of epilepsy, or traumatic brain injury. Treatment often involves using an antipsychotic medication along with a benzodiazepine. So antipsychotic medications include haloperidol, risperidone, olanzapine, um, Zyprecidine or ketiapine. 
Um, the, the brand names for these are Haldol, Risperdal, Zyprexa, Geodon, or Seroquel. Um, and you, people are on these for the duration of their post ictal psychosis. So clinical features for, for people to recognize is that post ictal psychosis often appear in older individuals than those with schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a primary psychiatric disorder that typically starts in someone in their mid twenties. Um, there may be, after a cluster of seizures, there's a period where there is normal behavior, but over hours to a few days, psychosis can emerge. Um, and usually the psych psychiatric symptoms are delusions of persecution, delusions of grandiosity, hyper-religiosities. Sometimes patients would have elevated mood, excessive happiness, excessive elation, hypergraphia, meaning writing excessive writing or agitated behavior. Psychiatric symptoms can include hallucinations, uh, visual or auditory, but sometimes they have disorganized thought. They can't process information correctly or there is a jumbled mess. And this can last up to 14 days from their last seizure. Drug reactions. Um, it can happen in people starting a new medication. We talk about a drug reaction where um, uh, it, it, it happened in about 10 to 15% of adverse reactions. Most common, there's this sort of um, diffuse redness, flat red spots that sort of coalesce. Um, I'm not sure if you could see it, but uh, if you look at the arm, there's this large red patch. This can happen with many, uh, seizure medications, and antimicrobials such as penicillin, um, amoxicillin, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as uh, ibuprofen or naproxen can also cause this. All right, these drug eruptions can be very itchy. A more severe hypersensitivity reaction can occur anywhere between one in a thousand or two in a million users. So it's, it's a very rare condition, but it's something that we should look out for. Um, Sometimes we talk about this drug reaction with eosinophilia and symptoms, systemic symptoms called DRESS. This is more severe. Not only is there a drug eruption, you're having a skin reaction, but there is a fever, flu-like symptoms, enlarged lymph nodes, facial swelling, um, hepatitis, um, or inflammation of the liver, inflammation of the kidneys, of the, of the lungs, and muscles. So this can happen in two to eight weeks from the initiation of the medication. Now, I can't find a very pleasant picture for this, but Steven Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis is a spectrum disorder. So the less severe form of it is Steven Johnson's. The most severe form of it is toxic epidermal necrosis. Um, and when I see patients, I tell people, watch out for a drug rash, especially with a medication like lamotrigine. Um, the difference is that not only is there a rash, but there's blistering and loss of skin tissue. The, so it almost looks like you can have a, it almost looks like you have a severe burn. So the skin rash can affect the hand where you have these target lesions, these circles with a bullseye in the middle or ulcerations around um, the mucosa, that's the lips, around the eyes, around the anus. So any like um, uh, mucosal lining, people can develop fevers, sore throat, severe swallowing pain, burning of the eyes. Um, treatment involves stopping the medication. So you have to recognize it quickly and stop the medication. Patients have to go to the emergency department. Typically they're admitted to the intensive care unit or a burn unit so that we treat these skin lesions like second degree burns. Sometimes they are given cortical steroids to stop the immune system, um, hydration and dressing of the wounds and, and supportive care. So typically drugs that are associated with Steven Johnson syndromes, what I have is lamotrigine, carbamazepine, phenytoin, less often with phenobarbital and valproic acid, but sometimes the antibiotics are the most prone ones to cause it. In the Asian population, sometimes we send out for genetic testing 
if for these certain genetic haplotypes, we call it sort of a phenotype that if we see that this person carries this trait, this genetic trait, we wouldn't start the lamotrigine or carbamazepine for these. And that's why we usually start at a very low dose of the medication um, because high doses are often triggers for the skin reaction. Um, and just the last minute, I'm just going to go through sort of anti-epileptic drug toxicity. Um, this is often with the older medication where sometimes people are on a very stable dose, but sometimes if you are given another medication, like an antibiotic, um, something else, um, it can affect how well that medication is cleared. So signs of acute anti-drug uh, anti-epileptic drug toxicity, I think I skipped that one, signs of acute toxicity includes confusion, ataxia, which is difficulty with balance and coordination, double vision, jerky eye movements, sedation, lethargy, and coma. Those are signs of a drug toxicity. So they need to be you know, checked out in the emergency department, get medication levels to see if they're intoxicated from their medications. Toxicity from anti-epileptic medications could be due to just accidentally taking too much medicine, or there's an intentional overdose. Um, if the provider wrote out an instruction for too quick of a, of a medication titration, or there's an introduction of another medication that interacts with your current medication. Most notoriously is the phenytoin, and, and the, which is the dilantin and carbamazepine, which is the Tegretol. Sometimes people taking herbal supplements can trigger anti-epileptic drug toxicity. So compounds such as ginkgo um, biloba, St. John Wart's ginseng can induce some of these um, uh, medication toxicity. Older individuals just do not tolerate some of the, what we call sodium channel blockers, that's lamotrigine, oxcarmazepine, Lacosamine to pyramid, it makes them very off balance, even at low doses. So those are some toxicity of the medications. Um, so if you're given a new medication, especially an antiretroviral um, or such as Placovid, um, I think that's the, the um, uh, COVID-19 antiretroviral medication. Um, if you're on an anti-epileptic medication and your doctor says you need to go on um, placo, uh, Plalovid, I think that's the name of it, um, just check with your neurologist to see if there's any significant interaction that would require you to adjust the dose of your anti-seizure medication. All right. Um, I think this is the last one, um, but I'll leave this page up. I know I went a bit over time. Um, let's see, I see a couple of names in the chat. Um, um, Dr. Lim, yeah. could you, I think you knew this. For some reason, it didn't start the recording at the beginning. So can you okay. show your first slide, which shows who you are? Oh, okay. I mean, you can come back to this, but I don't yeah. think they got the... Um, the beginning of who you are. Um, so, yeah. So I'm Dr. Lim. I'm uh, one of the epilepsy doctors in St. Luke's Neurology Associates. I, I mostly treat um, adult patients. Um, so usually greater than 17 years of age. Um, I know with St. Luke's, they did hire a couple of pediatric neurologists that will manage patients um, less than 17 years of age. Right, and that's, that's Bethlehem, PA. So, because some people look at these videos and they don't know where they're coming from. Okay. Um, I, I really don't see any questions, um, but uh, just really interesting stuff. I thank you so much for coming out. Um, I learned a lot. Um, and um, so if there's no questions, go check one more time. I don't really see any. And I think, and Ellen, you could correct me if I'm wrong, because I think I looked up, because I was curious on what kind of education people have had for using like the rescue medications. Um, uh, Epilepsy.com, the website itself, I think there was a video of like a, one of the nurses sort of showing on a dummy on how to use 
the diazepam rectal gel. So if you are given the prescription for the rectal gel to review that um, or call the office and the nursing, the, the clinical team can go through the instruction on how to use the rectal gel. It's, it's often cumbersome because of the steps that you have to go through. And with the adult population, we don't prescribe this too much, but we go with the nasal, nasal sprays because it, it's like Narcan. People are very familiar with Narcan. Um, and it's, it's just very easy to administer. Um, and you don't have to worry about sticking something in somebody's mouth while they're actively seizing. So. Um, <clears throat> would it be possible to, to get a, this PowerPoint? People are asking for that. Uh, I, I, could, I could give that to you. Um, I'll, I'll give it to um, yeah, Ellen. To me, these these <laughs> pictures are copyrighted. I guess there's some information as to where they're located on them. So I, I don't hold any rights to them, but it, if it's only for educational purposes, yeah, I think you could. Um, Great. It's, well, thank you very much for coming out and educating us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, thanks again. Have a good night. Okay, I see. You. Yeah, all right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, let me see, I'll stop share. Okay. All right, so just, Ellen, just get in contact with me on how you want it um, delivered.